Hello, everyone, and welcome. Amy Conlon here with Noreen Corsi and Donna Finnerman. I wanted to uh, introduce these wonderful ladies to you because they are centering our parish around a wonderful collection that we're all hopefully participating in this Lent season. Hello, ladies. Good afternoon. Hi. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Noreen, um, why don't you talk a little bit about um, St. John of the Cross and his previous involvement in uh, Brian Baggs, and then just a little bit of an overview of, of what Brian Baggs is. Okay. Um, back in 2016, we started a Lenten Parish program. For We go from Ash Wednesday right after to um, Palm Sunday. And during that time, we collected items for the Brian bag. There's about 20 items that go into each bag. And Donna had given us a list. We had met her. She came and spoke to the confirmation class. She also came and spoke with the parents. And we're very moved by the work that she does. Um, and Brian was her twin brother. And it was uh, in the local newspapers when he had been found, or someone found his body in the Naugatuck River. And um, it's just a wonderful uh, program that we started. And it was incredibly tremendous uh, outpour from our parish of uh, giving. And um, one year we did have Donna come with Father Samolan and we worked on putting to get together the bags. The past few years with the pandemic, we've just collected the items and given to her and then we have a few people in the parish that want to that volunteer to help put the bags together because there's a certain way they go. But um, it's been amazing, um, the results. And it's what, what she does is instead of people worry about giving money when they see a homeless person and they don't want to roll down the window and worry what they'll do with the money, this way you just give them a bag and it's filled with all necessities that they need and things even as far as electrical tape, which you don't think about, but for them mending their, their um tents or wherever they're leaving. It has a first aid kit in it. You just hand them that when you see a homeless person. My husband and I both keep one and he keeps it one in his truck, I keep one in my car, because you never know when you come upon at a stoplight or you see someone. I, I've been as far as in Middletown giving them out when I've been heading you know, down to the shore. But mostly if I'm just traveling around in the Waterbury area, come across a different to this homeless person and just hand it, hand it to them. And I, it makes me feel very good to, you know, be helping. And each one has a gift card in it, like uh, McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts. That's um, great. So uh, we'll talk a, a bit more, Donna, with you in, in a moment about the whole story and background. And uh, we'll talk more specifically about the bags. But just organizationally, Noreen, um, so people know, there's going to be collections at both campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, where are they located? There's a, be a basket on the altar at St. John of the Cross. And we've done that in the past. We put it right in the front. When you come in for mass, just come up and put whatever donation you have, leave it there. And then at um, Sacred Heart in the atrium by the center where the cross, the Lenten cross will be, there's going to be another basket. And just any item that you have. And most of the items are like a dollar. So it, Big or small, whatever, um, socks, toothpaste. Um, we do cookies and crackers and, and um, the tuna cans and stuff that, like, you get them at the dollar store. And we just leave it, and then afterwards we have volunteers that will pick up after our, every mass, and we have places to store them. And then usually, because our response has been so great, I call Donna, and probably, like, after three weeks, she comes and picks up the first load of donations that we have. Great. And then we'll go to Palm Sunday and after that 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock mass at St. John of the Cross, then we'll be ending before Holy Week begins. Great. Um, so there are, in the bulletin, there will be a list of these items that mm -hmm. are very specific to the bag. So we want to make sure that we're bringing in what's requested. Even though we might think something's a good idea, there's a real science behind this. Yeah. So uh, let's talk with you, Don, a little bit about <laughs> who you are and, and how you got here. And, um, and you know, and I'm very sorry for the loss of your brother. That, that you. must, you know, even though it's been some time, must still <laughs> feel very, very close. 
I'm sorry to start out that way, with, but I understand. Thank you. Um, I started this project. My, brother, my twin brother, Brian, um, witnessed 9-11, worked on Wall Street, um, saw people jumping to the, his, their deaths, the buildings collapsing. Um, he was never the same. Came and lived with my husband and I for two years and just rocked at our dining room table. Smoked a lot of cigarettes and really didn't say too much. Got a job <clears throat> after two years, got a job, was working very well, working in Waterbury. Had a job, got an apartment, and he was on the road to recovery. And on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, the ringing of all the people that had died on that day, PTSD set in. It was like it just happened yesterday to him. And he went on a, a rant and a rave. More people died after 9-11 from the cancer and depression, homelessness, than the people that actually died in the 9-11 towers. Um, my brother um, was homeless. Um, I did not know he was homeless. Um, I was uh, helping him for about six months after he lost his job, bringing him to the grocery store, buying him cigarettes, giving him some money, and making ends meet. He was getting unemployment. I figured his rent was getting paid. Evidently, when I was knocking on his door, he wasn't answering me. I was leaving letters, call me, call me, never called me. And then one day, a lady kept knocked, I knocked on his door, and a lady opened the door and said, are you Donna? You've been leaving these notes here for six months. Your brother hasn't lived here in almost seven months. So I knew something was wrong. So I went out looking for my brother every day, and I did not find him. Um, one day on October uh, 10th, 2016, uh, the detective came to our house and said that they found the remains of a homeless man on the banks of the Naugatuck River. And the ID close by his remains was of my brother. So they went to the library where he had a library card. He was from New York, so he didn't drive. And um, at the library, he had a next to kin written on his um, application for his library card there. And that's how they found me. I did the DNA testing, and um, it, that took a very, very long time. He was found on October 10th. They got in touch with me on October 20th. And October 21st, I did the DNA testing. My brother's remains were not given back to me until the end of January of 2017. And with that, um, I was trying to claim his body um, through the medical examiner's office. And then all of a sudden, um, Father Sullivan, um, the pastor of the Assumption Church down in Seymour, um, he was trying to claim my brother's body also. He did not want the um, his best friend, Kevin Zack, found my brother's bones in the woods, and they did not want the homeless man. I'm sorry. That's okay. Take your time. <laughs> Take your time. They did not want the homeless man to go unclaimed. So while I was trying to claim my brother's body, um, Father Sullivan also was trying to claim it, and because he was a priest, and he had told the people at the medical examiner's office that nobody was claiming this man's body. His his case number was two thousand. His case number was two thousand sixteen one ninety nine. Two thousand sixteen was the year he died, and he was the hundred and ninety ninth homeless person not claimed. And I had to refer to him as that every time I called, and this broke my heart. I'm thinking, how long could this be that they can hold on to this bones of a man? I'm thinking it's getting close to Christmas. I was very depressed because it was taking so long. Um, and then on December 22nd, my phone rang two minutes after I talked to the medical examiner's office about my brother's remains. They said they still have not gotten um, to the DNA testing. Um, the, the shortage with the state, they cut down the people that work there. A lot of overdoses were happening, and they were just trying to keep up with the work that the workflow that they were having coming in on a daily basis. So when I hung up the phone from um, the state's medical examiner's office, the next phone call that came in was um, a priest by the name of Father Sullivan, 
I was very depressed. I was going to take my life that day. And he called me. I wanted my twin brother to be buried with me. I didn't want him to be buried alone. He died alone in the woods, homeless, with nobody around him. And I wanted him to be buried with me. So I asked the state's medical examiner's office if I did not claim him, can my husband claim him? And they said yes. He said yes. I had all my letters written to my husband and my three kids asking them for forgiveness, that God will forgive me for taking my life. And I wanted Brian to be buried with me at the end of my funeral, just put him in near my feet. Now this pain was from your loss, from this whole, how do it you was from, where it you was were from, at? It was from a loss of my twin brother. Mm -hmm. It was also a loss of my four remaining brothers because my brother was homeless and they had lost contact with my brothers for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents had died very young. And as boys, they don't connect. Like I was the, the female in the family. I was the only girl out of six brothers. I'm the one who called all my brothers. I, I was the, the caller at everything. Mm -hmm. My brothers were very distant to each other. So they have not seen Brian in many years. Um, even after 9-11, they didn't contact him. He moved to Connecticut. He was living his life great. And um, the day when the detectives came, my brothers um, came from all over, from Vermont, New York, Florida, all over. And they told me not to claim his body. Let, the, let him be buried in Potter's Field. And I was like, how can you let one of our loved ones be buried in Potter's Field? And it's about money, and it's about burying somebody, and they have more concern for their pets than they had for my twin brother. They didn't realize that I had a bond with my brother. I knew he had passed away before the detective even came to my house. I felt animals eaten at him. Mm. I felt that he was not at peace. He was in the woods and I couldn't find him. And because of the depression, I have a lovely family. Mm. I have a lovely husband. I have three of the most well-rounded children. And I still was thinking of suicide because I wanted my brother to be at peace with me. Let's go to heaven together. We're twins. We were born together. And he's older than me. You know, he always watched out for me because I was the girl twin and he was the boy and I was the only girl out of all these boys. So because my brothers did not want me to get his remains, I did the DNA testing the day after they left my house. I went right down to the police department and I said I was going to do this. And that's what I did but I was getting so depressed because it was just taking so long, so long. I mean, weeks and weeks turned into months and you're talking about from October, Thanksgiving came and I had nothing to be thankful for. My brother was still not claimed. Christmas is right around the corner now, December 22nd. I had the time picked out, the place picked out in my backyard where I was gonna take my life. I wanted Brian to be buried with me. And then I called the state's medical examiner's office and they said to me, they still did not, I was telling you, I was yelling at them. I said, it's Christmas, he's somebody's brother, he's somebody's kid. I was like, I said, you've had him for such a long time. I don't want you to lose him. He's just bones, the police officer told me. And I didn't want you to lose him. So that day, I hung up the phone from the state's medical examiner's office and then within seconds, my phone rang. And I said to myself, let this be the last telemarketer that I talked to. And I picked up the phone. It said, Derby, Connecticut. I don't know too many people in Derby. I'm from New York. A lot of my phone calls come from New York. I don't know too many people in Derby, Connecticut. I really didn't know anybody in Derby, Connecticut. So I picked up the phone and I heard this very calm voice saying this is Father Jim from the Church of Assumption. Is this Donna? And I said, yes. And he said, are you the sister, the twin sister of the homeless man? And I was like, yes, how did you know that? 
and he told me because of the laws um, that the state's medical examiner's office that he had called earlier that day had given him just my first name and my phone number, saying that I was trying to claim him also. And Father Sullivan, his name was Father Jim, he told me. Father Jim told me that, that his best friend, Kevin Zack, who cleans the Naugatuck River, found my brother's remains in the woods and that they wanted to do a mass for a homeless man that nobody knew and asked me if that was okay. I knew right then and there that God did not abandon me. I knew that there was something that he wanted me to do here in this world. So Father Sullivan said he talked to me for over half an hour. I can't really remember too much he said because all I was saying, they were sitting there saying, thank you, Lord. God. Thank you, Lord. I called my husband at his job after I hung up from Father Jim and I said to my husband, I said, Walter, I said, this priest just called me and he saved my life. Now my husband knew I was depressed. He knows we have guns in the house. He said to me, Donna, don't do anything stupid. I'm on my way home. He came home and I told him all about this priest who saved my life. I gave him all the letters that I had written that had stamps on them. I had letters written to all my brothers, blaming them for my death. I wanted them to know that it wasn't me being stupid, that I wanted them to realize what they caused in my family. And then um, after Christmas, Father Sullivan called me again. He asked me how I was doing and I said, good. There was still no word about the, the, the DNA testing. Comes down to it, come early February, they called me and said it was 99.9 that I was the twin sister. And I was like, thank you. Thank you, God. I can take them. Father Sullivan said that they were gonna do, a cre they, we did a cremation, and that Father Sullivan invited me to come to his church. Now, mind you, when I walked in, he said, come 15 minutes early, I'll be in the back of the church. I'd like to talk to you, and he knows about my husband, Walter, and I wanted to talk to you and Walter about what I'm gonna to talk to the parishioners that day at mass. Father Sullivan said he wasn't gonna use my name. He just wanted to have me sit in the front row seats. So my husband and I, we sat in the front row seat. Okay, so when I walked into the church, the priest that was greeting my husband and I married my son three years prior. He opened up his Bible and he said, I pray for Billy and Caitlin thinner and every day. It was the second wedding that Father Sullivan ever did as a priest. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my goodness. So I'm still a, you know, in shock over everything that's happening. I sat down in the front row seat. Then five minutes later, this couple sat right next to us and I moved in. My husband was sitting here, I was sitting here, a gentleman was sitting here and his wife over there. And they said hello to me. I was like, hello. They didn't know who I was. Father Sol Sullivan's homily that day, first thing he said was, how many people would come to a funeral for a mass of a homeless man if you didn't know them? And of course me sitting in the front row, I just wanted to look. I wanted to feel what these people at this church felt. And I have to tell you, every hand was raised. And then he says, the man that I'm talking about is Brian O'Connell. And the man that's sitting right next to Donna, the twin sister sitting in the front row with her husband, Walter. And this man looked at me and he says, Father Sullivan says, my best friend, Kevin Zack, who is sitting right next to Donna Finneran is the man who found her brother's bones in the woods. Kevin took his hand, took it to my hand, he put it up to his chest and he said, I've been looking for you for a long time. And I was like, oh my goodness. The police had told me that a homeless man found my brother's remains. And here I am sitting next to a man that found my brother's remains. And a long story short, we had a beautiful mass for my brother. The next week, 
over 350 people attended a mass for a homeless man that nobody knew. I knew right then and there from that day that God had a plan for me, that I had to do something. I've been a stay-at-home wife for over 25 years. I've raised three kids, a father-in-law who lived with us till he was 97, had just passed away six or seven months prior to all of this going on. And I said to my husband, I think I'm gonna go get a job. My husband looked at me and said, go do some volunteer work. He's looking to retire in a few years, didn't want me to go back to work. Then it came to us that night. I said, I was gonna help the homeless. Sandra, Kevin's wife, she said to me one time that they give out these bags, they're called Reggie bags. Brian lived in the woods and lived underneath a wooden tree. And when Kevin first found them, he was huddled underneath the tree that he had cleaned out all the leaves and the dirt, and he was sleeping in there in the woods, in the, in the hollow of the trees that had fallen. And where was this? In the banks of the Naugatuck River. Right, still there. Now Reggie lived in a nice little tent that had lean tubes, that had tarps. And it was, it was pretty big. And he told my brother that there's this man, the homeless man, just got into an apartment and his tent is free. And Kevin showed him where this tent was. So my brother went and moved into the tent where Reggie lived. Kevin and Sandra said that they did Reggie bags. They helped every homeless person. They got a Walmart bag and they put water and socks and cookies in it. And they gave it out to all the homeless people that they met. They cleaned the Naugatuck River. A lot of the homeless are on the river. Mm -hmm. That's where they clean themselves and get away from all the population of the people. And then um, I went home and I told my daughter Liz, I said, they make Reggie bags. Maybe we can do that too. So I turned around to Sandra and I said, Sandra, can we make Brian bags? And I said, I didn't want to change the name from Reggie to take it away from Reggie because Reggie, I've met Reggie and I didn't want to take away his bags. And she said, no, Donna, change the name to Brian bags. So that's where the Brian bags came into. And um, that year, 2017, on Easter, we went down to New York City with 200 Brian bags and we gave them out to the homeless, right where Wall Street is and down there where Brian worked. And what's the response when you hand someone a bag? What was that like? Oh, it was beautiful. Every homeless person said, it's just what I needed. Some of them would just rip open the bags just to get the water. The water is the most important thing to a homeless person. They can't go into a restaurant like you and I mm -hmm. and drink water. Um, so just to see their expression, some of them, remember, it's, it's Easter time, and they're taking off their shoes that had no socks, and they were putting on these brand new clean socks, um, and it was just a beautiful thing. Um, my kids, some of them went uptown, my husband and I and my daughter, we went to Wall Street. That's where Brian was, and we walked around for, I wanna say, three, four hours, and we didn't see not one homeless person. They cleaned up the city down there. It wasn't like I was when I worked on Wall Street where you would see a homeless on every corner. And I was like, my husband was like, don't worry, Donna. God did not put him in our face today. But there'll be other times. But we went uptown to meet my kids and they all ran out of their Brian bags and we had our bags to give out. And uh, we were just giving them out and it was just a beautiful thing. And I knew that this is what we gotta do. And to this day, we've made, I can't even tell you, how many churches in school that do Brian bags? Um, schools down in New York City even collect me items for the Brian bag. They, we give out brand new stuff to the homeless. Let's um, talk about that because it's evolved into a very specific project. You want to show yeah. us a every, sample of that? Every Brian bag is made the exact same way. A, a, the Church of Assumption, the very first year when we went to do Brian bags, Father Sullivan said, can we start a collection of just the things that are in this bag? And it was funny how when we didn't know how many items we had and we counted out all the bags, we had 365 bags. Wow. And isn't that a beautiful thing? 365 for a whole year, one homeless person got a bag. That's the way we looked at it. And that was a beautiful number to start out, 365. 
And then a few months later, the church did another collection for me, and we did well over a thousand Brian bags. And this is where the mustard seed grows. The church makes the bags, and everybody puts them in their car. It has water, it has tuna, it has a gift card, it has a first aid kit, a toothbrush, toothpaste. We switch it off um, from toothpaste to toothbrush to deodorant and tissues, um, and it has crackers and a Slim Jim. The most important thing is the socks. Every Brian bag has a brand new pair of socks. That's the number one thing that a homeless person needs. St. John's the Evangelist, the church in my town, collected me socks just a couple of months ago. 1,700 pairs of socks in, from one church. It's not just that I can do this by myself. Um, I started a nonprofit, 5013C. My nonprofit makes about 50 grand a year, and I can tell you that every penny that is made goes to a homeless person. So how do you make money? Is it just donations that come in, cash donations? Donations come in, um, and with that money, um, I have to, the, the Archdiocese of Hartford gives me a, a very large check every year. Um, and the first- And that's from the Archbishop's Annual Appeal. The, uh, yep, the uh, Archbishop Annual Appeal. And the very first year when I got that check, um, I was leaving the uh, Church of the Basilica and um, there was this homeless man in Waterbury on the green. And he had, it was a rainy day, and he had no shoelaces and no socks on his feet. And I said to him, buddy, what size shoe are you? And he says, I'm a 13. I said, are you staying at the St. Vincent's de Paul shelter? He said, yes, how'd you know that? You know, it's a shelter for <laughs> homeless people. I said, I'll be there tonight at five o'clock and I'll have your pair of shoes for you and a pair of socks for you. So be there and look for my red car. I have a red car. I go to Walmart, I buy one pair of shoes and a bag of socks for him. But I have to tell you, I pulled up to that shelter line and there was a line and it had 200 people on it. How can I give one pair of shoe out to everybody on that line who needed a pair of shoes? So he saw me right away and I was like, come with me. And I'm driving my car past all these people and I'm like, come with me, come with me. And I went into the parking lot behind Home Depot and I gave him his shoes and his socks. He put them on his feet and he says, I'm gonna do a happy dance. I knew right from that day, I had to do something with all the money that the Archbishop gave me. I went back to Walmart and I ordered over 400 pairs of men's work boots. I have to tell you, Walmart in Naugatuck and in the Walmart in Waterbury, they gave me those shoes that were $29.95 and they gave them to me for $9.99 a oh, pair. Wow, that's great. I was like, what a beautiful thing. And we have homeless that are women, but I wanted to do something special for our homeless women. I feel for them. I do. So I went to Boscoff's in Meriden and I bought them the most beautiful pairs of boots. I bought 55 pairs and all different sizes, colors, that you can imagine the same size boot, you know, diff just different sizes. And I gave them out to all the women, but I had to pay $29.95 for them. I didn't get a discount, but I felt like I got such a good discount out of the men's, I didn't even ask for a discount. It all yeah. works out. It all works out. And then I came to this conclusion that I'm not, I have to treat the homeless better. I'm not going to give them nothing used. I'm not going to give them somebody else's used shoes. The homeless people, our friends, they walk nine to 10 miles a day when they get out of the shelter. Can you imagine if they have to put on somebody else's shoes that are worn? Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're gonna get blisters, they're gonna get bubbles, and I just felt like nobody should have to walk a mile in anybody's shoe except for brand new shoes. So I only give out brand new stuff to the homeless. And people will say to me, Donna, they're homeless, they probably don't care. But I treat every homeless person that it's Christ that I'm giving those shoes to. And that's the way that we should treat them. Remind me of Mother Teresa. No, <laughs> that same spirit, that same vision, 
That's wonderful. Um, it's so inspiring to hear your story. What is something that you think that people should know about homeless people now that you've met so many and interacted? What's one thing that we should really try and understand? I think that you, everybody should understand when they see a homeless person that to know that that homeless person did not wake up that day and say, I want to be homeless. It just happens. If you listen to their stories why they're homeless, you would have a better understanding of a homeless person. Not one of them said, I think I want to be homeless today. It is the hardest struggle that God has given anybody. We all come out of our struggles. We are all given struggles in our daily life. And how we come out of them is how we are as a person. But a homeless person, if you talk to them, their struggles go on for years and years, you know, and they just don't come out of it as quickly as we come out of our struggles. So if people would see that a homeless person, and not my biggest thing is to tell people never to judge a homeless person. I go and I do these talks. I tell people, we give them brand new shoes. This year with the Archdiocese money, I went out and I bought coats that are $80. And I want my homeless friends to be warm. I want them to look good, but I want them to be warm. I want those coats to have a hood. I want deep pockets in case they lose their gloves. And I tell everybody, please do not judge that homeless person on the corner. Don't look down at their shoes and say they have better shoes than you or their coat is better than yours because somebody has given them that coat. A lot of our friends will tell me they're not wearing their new shoes because they don't want to be judged. So if we come out of it not judging anybody, we would do better. I was struck when, in your story when you were saying that you didn't know your brother was homeless. So people live and keep up this front, for lack of a better word, this um, ability to not have you, people who know and love and are related to them, to keep this very, very private. This is something that they're working to try and come out of. They don't right. want to bring their family into it. it. It's real concern. It's very hard for me because um, the reason why Brian didn't want to come and live with me, because when, um, when he had lost his job, I, I was seeing him every week. I said to him, Brian, come back and live with us. He's lived with us for three years when our kids were little during when 9-11 first happened. But I have to tell you, my father-in-law died. All my kids, my last kid is off to college. I have a big, beautiful house, three empty bedrooms. Brian, you got your pick of your choice of what bedroom you want. He didn't want to be a burden on me and my husband. So he never told us. And there are people out on the street that have family members that they just don't know that they've been homeless. And you're right. It's a... Sh it's, they're shamed, they're embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And mental illness, too, is out there. Um, it, it's a cause of being homelessness, right. you know? Right. So, so much compassion and such a purposeful way to help. Um, it's such a wonderful idea, Noreen, that you had to um, bring this out to the wider parish and extend it into our new parish family. Um, what is something that you feel that, that you've gotten from participating in this giving? Um, <laughs> a friend. <laughs> a friend, a, a friend. <laughs> Faith in, in seeing the generosity of, of, of parishioners, of giving. You know, we've been here for a number of years now, but we were up at the other end of the state for over 40 years. And when we came down, I brought a few different ministries, ideas, and the parishioners would say, well, how do you know? I said, you don't have to look very far. You know, like they were like, well, how do you know that people need help? And I'm like, everywhere you look, there's people that need help. Just be willing, and they're so incredibly generous. And they, ha you know, have been with any of the things that we've done in collections. But um, I think sometimes we get too busy, and people forget about others, you know, that there's a real need out there in the homeless. Like Donna said, nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to be homeless. You know, I just think it's a great idea. I mean, I don't need a house. Nobody does that. Circumstances cause it. And a lot of it, some of it's mental illness, and some of it is 
PTSD from mm -hmm. all different circumstances. Mm -hmm. When we hear the shame of our country for our vets, it really bothers me because not to say the majority are men, but a lot are men. And Donna's worked with oh. a lot of men and, and on the green, you know, in places in Waterbury. And I had someone, you know, I would say to people, just give me anything you have because I'll find a home for it. And I had a blanket someone had gotten, given money, and they've got this U.S. vet blanket. And I said, oh, no, I'll take it, I'll take it. And Donna's like, I know the, just the person. I know just the vet I'm going to give this to that's homeless. That you have to just, I don't know, think what it's given me, uh, just knowing in some little way that I'm helping someone, you know, out there that's struggling because it's a struggle. They don't choose to be homeless for whatever reasons. And we shouldn't ever judge someone. First of all, you never know. I mean, it could happen to you. Don't think it couldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, like we've learned with even just the pandemic, the rug can be pulled out from underneath every anyone, you know, or your children, or you, you don't know. You know, mm -hmm. you can't just say never, never is going to happen to me. But it's, it's a good, a really good feeling to know. And when you give the bag to someone, <laughs> that's even like, it's contagious. Wow. It's yeah. It's contagious. It's right? like the, it if you could see their face, <laughs> right. that this whole bag, like they're giving me all these things. You just you can't. And it's coming from a person that I haven't met, and you know yeah. that that there is this kindness out there. So uh, what I heard is that it can be as simple as an item of crackers, mm -hmm. toothpaste. Um, times as many things or t as much as you want to give right and then it all just comes, comes together, together. Yep. Um, and then gets distributed so there's you know that's what I love about a parish is that right. every everybody can just give what they can mm -hmm. right. you know to to whatever degree that they can and the way it comes together just keeps on giving and giving because I think that it is hard for people to engage homelessness and uh, without judgment or how do I help and um, this is just a wonderful way to invite people into participating into it and then just to see what happens when it expands and I just think that you both um, are really inspiring and uh, leading us in this direction and uh, what a wonderful Lenten project for it us was, to for yeah. you know just be purposeful and um, you know, because sometimes we wonder, okay, when, how am I going to go about it this year? What's something that's getting my attention? Mm -hmm. So maybe people are going to have a response to this and feel really called to participate in it, um, into their own um, ability to give as, as well as, you know, what's going on inside of me this Lent that I need to pay attention to. How can I grow closer to God by maybe sacrificing something and giving and and just the way that it worked in your life mm -hmm. i am um wondering if there's anything in concluding here that maybe you want to say <clears throat> it doesn't matter how much you give i will tell you a quick story about these two little girls at my church who gave me two dollars that their grandfather had given to them they right away the next day see me at daily mass donna i got a dollar for you and the other sister says, Donna, I got a dollar for you, too. Mm -hmm. Can you please help a homeless man? I feed them at the Basilica. We make about 50 sandwiches a day for the homeless. They line up in the back. Mm -hmm. This guy, Mark, said to me one day, now, they never ask me for money, you know. He says, Donna, I need a dollar seventy-five to get up to Torrington. I said, Mark, today's your lucky day. I got $2 <laughs> that these two girls gave you. I put it on my Facebook account. All I wrote was, I, and I took a picture of the girls giving me the $2. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to show Mark the $2. I said, Mark, can I take a picture of you holding the $2 so I can show it to the girls that how God works, how the very next day. And all I did was put it on my Facebook account. And all I wrote was from, the God, from, from God's children to the faithful. I didn't have to say anything else. My phone was ding and ding and ding and all over a $2 donation. We got a homeless man home. His sister lives in Rochester, New York. Um, somebody shared the post and shared the post. And they were like, is that Mark? Is that the Basilica Church in Waterbury? That looks like my uncle. 
Sure enough, it took Mark a whole week to come back to get a sandwich from me because remember, I sent him to Torrington for the $1.75. He had a panhandle to get the $1.75 to come back and all over a $2 donation, um, he got to go home. And you see, it's a little, little donation and it, it made such a big difference in a homeless person's life. And it was so meant to be in that moment. What a beautiful, beautiful story. So everyone, I hope that you will participate in this Lenten collection. It's going to run for a while. Um, so it concludes on Palm Sunday. And then all of the items are going to be assembled with care, right? Mm -hmm. In a very particular way. Yep. It's like a military and pack a, almost. A prayer yeah. in every yeah. bag. Every yeah. bag has a prayer in it too. Well, so why don't we uh, conclude by you reading this prayer for us? Okay, can you read it? I don't have my glasses, sorry. Oh, that's okay. I know it'd be hard. <laughs> A Brian bag. Let this little bag remind you that there are people that care about you and that there is always hope. Have a blessed day in remembrance of Brian. And the object of this bag is for the parishioners to do that collection, put the bag together with me, and then take the bags, put them in your car so that when you see a homeless person wherever you are, Danbury, Waterbury, they're in every town, that you can offer this bag to the homeless person. All you have to do is say, hi, my name is Donna. Can you use a hand up today? And they'll take it right out of your hand. So thank you. That's wonderful. Keeps on giving. It does. It does. We, um, we had, well, last year, because of the pandemic, we didn't get together and put them, put them yep. together. But Donna did. And then after she brought about 30-something back to, to St. John mm -hmm. of the Cross, and I put them in a big box, or a big basket rather, with a sign, please take one, only ask that they be over 18. Right. Or, um, and they were gone, instantly gone. I had some people ask for a couple extra, and which was really nice. So you never know, your little gesture, or just doing that, how you can change someone's life, you know? And you won't know it, but you'll know it in your heart, you'll, you'll know. I mean, that's what we're here, not to judge others, because it could be us at any time. And, and just in your own story, you know, what a difference a day makes, a oh. phone call, an interaction. Mm -hmm. So right. God bless you both. Thank, Thank you very you. much.